It's Wednesday, the 30th of November. This is Politics Live. With me today, Conservative MP Theresa Villiers, Labour MP Lloyd Russell Moyle, The Sun's political correspondent Natasha Clark, and will be joined by the executive editor of The Economist, Anne McElvoy, today. As more strikes loom this winter, the government says we can't afford big pay rises. Do workers need to accept below inflation increases? Thank you for your support. Slava Ukraini. Ukraine's First Lady addresses Parliament. Are we in danger of forgetting about the war? For the first time, less than half of the population now identify as Christian. We have hope, hope in God, and uh, you know, if God wants us here, then we'll continue. Theresa Villiers wants to get rid of housing targets. Are Conservatives like her turning their backs on younger voters? And we'll be live in the Commons at midday for Prime Minister's Questions. Let's start with strikes because ambulance staff in England have voted for strike action and nurses uh, for the very first time across the UK are to strike on two dates in December. This is the response from Steve Barclay, the health secretary, who has said that industrial action is in nobody's best interest and the NHS pay demands are not affordable, he says. Uh, the pay demand from nurses is a 19% pay rise. Uh, inflation is running at just over 11%, but nurses want 5% above the retail price index, a different measure uh, of inflation, uh, calculating the cost of living, which is actually at 14%. Um, so should public sector workers accept below inflation pay increases? Teresa. I think what, what is being asked for just, just isn't affordable. I, of course I want public sector workers to be paid more, but um, in these extremely difficult times caused in great part by global economic pressures and turmoil, you know, these, these kind of numbers just aren't affordable and therefore I would appeal for these strikes not to go ahead. Would you appeal to Steve Barclay, the Health Secretary, to sit down with the RCN, the Royal College of Nursing, and discuss what might be agreed, might be acceptable to both sides? Well, there is a very detailed process of, of pay is. review. Yeah. And I know And the government that... has to recommend and submit what they think uh, an affordable uh, and reasonable pay rise would be. So should Steve Barclay get involved? Well, I, I know that he will be wanting to do everything he can to, to raise wages in, in the NHS, but he is constrained by budgets. And of course, you know, the NHS is under great pressure in order to clear that backlog and, and strikes would have a damaging impact on that, a damaging impact on patients. So they really, really shouldn't go ahead. So they should be below inflation pay rises. Look, I, of course I would want to see inflation pay rises, but it just, in these instances, doesn't look to me as if it's going to be affordable. Um, what about your view, Lloyd? Should public sector workers accept below inflation rises, below 11.5%? No, I think that people should expect their wages to continue um, their living standards uh, as they are or to improve their living standards. Now, there are a number of levers the government can pull to make that happen. One of the levers the government could pull is to be more um, astute on reducing inflation, reducing the cost of living. Now, those are levers that then affect and advantage everyone. So you could do more on some of the energy uh, stuff, decoupling, uh, be quicker in decoupling the electricity prices from gas prices. That's not still yet decoupled, and that would have an inflationary effect. You could do more on, um, for example, uh, looking at the cost of living in terms of uh, prices for transport. And you see in Germany where they have limited and reduced the cost of uh, rail and bus transport, which 
has, these have deflationary impacts. And that means then, when quite rightly nurses and doctors come and say, we want our uh, living standard to maintain the same, they're not even asking, um, in some cases, for it to go above that, although the nurses are saying that they need to uh, be recognised for their uh, sacrifice mm. over COVID And as do you well. agree with them? I mean, when you say it should be at inflation, let's take the, mm -hmm. the general measure of inflation at 11.5%. Which doesn't um, include housing, so that's why uh, some people they do go for, go for RPI, Absolutely. because that includes housing. Fine. And one of the big costs is these mortgage costs. So are you saying 11.5% or are you saying higher? Well, I'm not putting a figure on it. It's oh, the unions right. to come forward and then it's for the government uh, and the employers to negotiate. But you are saying at inflation or above? But, but I think uh, inflation is a, is a decent asking point to start with, to say we want to stand still and then you negotiate from there. In most other European countries, I was in Norway a few weeks ago, what happens is the unions and the employers mm. sit down together, they have an arbitration process which is binding on both and so the unions can't go on strike but the employers have to pay the level that is agreed at. Now that's the kind of pact that Labour is talking about getting employers and businesses to work together for the betterment of this country. I'm afraid the Conservatives have totally left the court and they just push all these things further down the line. Well, before I come to you, Natasha, Theresa, do you want to respond to that? Yes, that, that's what Lloyd is saying is, is not true at all. I mean, the, the government is doing a huge amount to help people with the cost of living, including the energy price guarantee, which is saving the average household around £1,000. It's also supporting businesses as well, without which they would have to increase their prices. And the autumn statement is also a measure which is designed to to keep mortgage rates and inflation under control as much as possible. Natasha? Not working. It's tricky, isn't it? Because the government obviously between a rock and a hard place. And let's not forget, when we look back to the autumn statement, which was just a couple of weeks ago, um, the government agreed to uplift not just pensions, but benefits in line with inflation. So it's a really tricky argument to make for the government to then turn around and say, actually, these people, you know, do not deserve a pay rise in line with inflation, but pensioners and people on benefits do. That's a very tricky argument, mm -hmm. a very hard line mm -hmm. uh, to have to go down. But equally, when we look at what's happening in the private sector, uh, not everybody is getting that inflationary pay rise in the private sector either. So there will be many workers up and down the country going, I'm not getting an inflationary uh, pay rise, so why should, why should someone else? And you've just joined us, um, so let me just reprise a little bit. We're talking about the strike action. Ambulance uh, workers have voted for strike action. You'll know, obviously, nurses uh, are taking these two days of strike action in December, which is historic. Um, and Steve Barclay, the health secretary, has said we can't afford above inflation uh, pay rises. Um, should public sector workers accept, then, below inflation pay rises or not? I think they can aim for slightly above inflation pay rises, but they have to be quite careful about the envelope in which they demand that. And I think one of the issues that is there at the moment is Steve Barclay's clearly this is a negotiation. I mean, it may be a negotiation that strikes are the equivalent of a negotiation at, at gunpoint in peacetime. But you, you have to have a sort of realistic view of the public finances. I think what will happen is probably something that is a minor rise. It won't keep all the unions happy by any means, but it's important for both sides to get into that territory as soon as possible to avoid the disruption that would follow if these strikes go ahead at scale. Well, in Scotland, they've suggested 8% for newly qualified nurses, and that has started some negotiations and talks uh, with the RCN. Uh, let's move on. Let me show you this headline in the Daily Express. Less than half of population is Christian. Uh, the result of the 2021 census shows that fewer people than ever identify themselves Christian in England and Wales. Um, what's your response, Theresa? Well, it shows we're a more culturally diverse country than ever before. I think, you know, faith and religion is in, in very good heart in, in this country. There, there is a huge uptake across multiple different faiths. Um, so I th we'll all need to reflect on these census figures just in terms of what it tells us about you know, the successful culturally and ethnically diverse country that we are. Well, that is absolutely true, although the number of those who said they had no religion mm -hmm. increased to 37.2%, so 22 million as having no religion at all, so actually more of us becoming secular, broadly mm -hmm. speaking. Um, what was your response, um, well, certainly to the headline and obviously the detail behind it? It's, it's not a surprise at all. Um, I think one thing is clear is it's not that there are, it's a huge growth in other religions in this country, it's not that suddenly there's 
there's huge numbers of Hindus or Buddhists or Muslims beyond what we there already, have been increases, already but, but thought. From a, yeah. Yes. Yeah, from, 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 from a relatively minor group. Mm. The, the vast majority of increases here is, is non-religion. I suspect if they'd asked the question slightly differently, mm -hmm. are you a practicing Christian, which is not what they asked, because lots of people are culturally Christian, you know, they go to church once a year, they get married in church, you know. Yes. Um, uh, you know I go to church for Midnight Mass because I, I like the performance mm. and the celebration of it, you know, kind of. But I put non-religious, lots of my other colleagues will have put Christian for the same reason. So, so I do think that it's probably even a bigger uh, uh, margin. And I think that's fine. People are entitled to find their own rate through belief, and faith, and we should celebrate and support all. What I do think it says mm. is, for example, the BBC on Thought of the Day doesn't include non-religious voices on Radio 4. It does pose questions to how we ensure that our institutions ah. are reflecting all of those voices, including humanists. I'm a humanist, um, uh, but and humanism just is... just on the rest of is, the day, is, most is, of the time. Well, <laughs> is, 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 well is, let's not go through the, the radio. Well, here, is that religion is a space yeah. that needs a bit of protection, and even if it's well, well, around half I would or under half, is it's not... still a large proportion of the population. There's not an awful lot of it on the airwaves. It, exactly. Well, I think there is quite a lot of re religious and religious mm. culturally based um, stuff on the airwaves, actually. And, and I would argue that there is not very much uh, hu proactively humanist right. arguments on the airwaves. So I think well, we need a right balance. All right. Well, let's, right, talk, let, both. let's talk to uh, Sunder Katwala. We can pick up on uh, Anne's point, actually, uh, in a few minutes' time. He's the director of uh, British Future. Future think tank. Um, your response, what does, what does this census tell us about faith and non-faith in Britain? Well, I think it shows we're a plural society and an increasingly secular one. But, you know, I, I don't think it's as helpful to have a tug of war where if, you know, the Christian number is 51 or the Christian number is 46, so it means we're a Christian or a secular society. Clearly, it's got more diverse over time. There are 27 million people who still have some identification with Christianity, not packing out the churches every Sunday. I'm sure 22 million people now say, I declare with no religion. That's become more normalised if you used to just say C of E. Um, and, you know, <laughs> 6 million people of other, other faiths, 4 million Muslims and so on. So we've got to make that work. We need the rules of the road. How do we get that right for a society of many faiths and none? How do we rub along well enough together? Uh, and what about a little bit of context in terms of what Teresa was saying? We're more ethnically diverse, particularly in certain cities in England. Yes, and that's that's a, a rapid change over, over 50, 75 years, a more gradual change perhaps over the last 10 years. I think it's really important to discuss that well. You know, if you're like me, you're mixed race, you're not in the white British group. If people are saying, you know, is London, is Birmingham and Manchester too diverse now? That's not giving an equal status, an equal voice to half of those cities. The question isn't, you know, are we going to be a diverse society or not? That that was settled in the half century after mm. the Windrush mm -hmm. arrived. The question is, how do we make that work well? What feels fair for majorities and for minorities? The pace of change has felt quite fast, I think, for some older white British people. It's felt quite slow, I think, to younger British-born mm -hmm. ethnic minorities who still feel mm. there's more to do till yeah. they've got the equal opportunities that every government promises them. Right. Well, um, if you can stay with us, do, uh, Sunda. How, how do we make it work, uh, do you think, since uh, Sunda posed that question, Anne? I think it's a great point that mm. Sunda Kedwala makes, that it feels both fast in terms of a lot of older people, and we hear it and we see those reactions in society to say, the place I live in has changed and who asked me, and that that is something politicians of, of all parties need to, to take on board. But if you're a younger generation and you've mm. been born into a multicultural society, you feel it's quite slow. And if I'm honest, I would say, you know, if someone of a sort of small L liberal disposition, I think probably not seeing that that, that wasn't happening fast enough is something I would upbraid myself for. I think it was something that I kind of missed mm. for a lot of years and a lot of us are catching up with. So I think these two things are happening at once and it's how does the politics, even when we frame religious debates, cultural debates, social debates, mm. economic debates to an extent, mm. how do we accommodate these two things at once? That's where I think the parties struggle with it. Mm -hmm. Natasha? Yeah, um, I agree with what you were saying, I think, Lloyd, earlier about sort of we might not identify as Christians, but as a country, we still have, you know, they are, it's still very much a part of society and our culture and Christmas, Advent coming up. And, uh, you know, it's definitely not just Christians who celebrate that. And, and those parts of our institutions and our culture are still fair and are still a part of that life. And I think in, in a way, that's actually a, a way which we can better integrate ourselves in society and better integrate different faiths, races, religions all together together 
um, by coming together and, and celebrating in that way. And I think that's that, that's, that's more the way to, to sort of bring everybody together. And the pace of change, I mean, Lloyd, it, it, it is an interesting point, isn't it, that actually perhaps it hasn't actually been quick enough uh, for many young people and young people being anything uh, under 40, maybe. I think that there's an interesting urban-rural divide yes. here. And that's where it does start to look interestingly in terms of politics as well. Because we see urban, rural or urban small town divides in a political sense and we see them also in the census. We see also real divides between real poverty coming out in the census as well, between urban and rural as well. So th these things will matter politically. What I would like to see on some of the cultural issues and some of the race issues is us not uh, creating societies where people live in their silos of I'm a Christian or I'm white, but actually are able to celebrate and, and, and develop new cultures in, in a kind of, rather than treating cultures, religions, um, but either, and, uh, you know, kind of, and, and races as something that should be kept apart. It's actually about um, how do we come together and, and develop new things. And I think that's what some of, the, uh, um, some of the race figures show in terms of interracial relationships and mm. marriages. Actually, Britain is a country that actually wants to share and come together in many respects. And that's really quite exciting. Teresa? Well, I, I particularly agree with the last point that, that Lloyd made. I think, you know, this country is a tremendous success mm -hmm. story when it comes to you know, huge diversity in terms of faith and culture mm. um, and still huge, a huge amount of social cohesion and shared values. So I think we should celebrate that and celebrate the contribution that a whole range of faith communities make in our society. Whatever the numbers say, we have vibrant Christian communities and vibrant other faith communities playing their part in all sorts of aspects of our daily lives. I mean, should we be proud of it, Sunda, in the sense that uh, Theresa and Lloyd have set out? I think we can take quite a lot of confidence in how we're handling this change. If we're not complacent about it, if we work mm. Harder. I mean, one of the things under the surface here of this census is ethnic diversity is going to become politically more important, not just because it's growing, oh. but because it's spreading out as well. It's much okay. less an inner city uh, issue now, much more of a suburban issue in outer London, in the home counties, across the towns and the cities. That's going to be more important in, in the marginal seats. So something that was, you know, relatively marginal 20 or 30 years ago is going to be a more central feature. Everybody's got to get more confident in talking to different groups, talking to different generations and having a conversation about demographic change that isn't just talking to the white British or just talking to the mm. ethnic minorities, but trying to find that bridge and that contact. And we've been getting better at that, but we could work harder at it. Can I just return um, to the point that was raised by Anne and Lloyd when it comes to faith? Um, do the changes, do the figures point to an institutional response in any way, Sunder? Um, I don't see people calling for the disestablishment of the Church of England, for example, because that would be an incredibly complex thing that not many people care about. And people of minority faith kind of tend to tend to like that status of faith. There's a big opportunity, I think, for a different institutional message in the coronation next year. You've got a Christian king, the head of the established church, wants to talk about all of the diversity. You've got a prime minister who happens to be Hindu alongside him. You've got a Muslim mayor of London. They can have a shared agenda about what it means to, mm. you know, respect respect our diversity but work on what we've got in common and that can cross faith lines that can cross ethnic lines it can cross geographic and generational lines as well i think sunder catwaller thank you uh, did you want to just uh, i just wanted to say it's a shame we can't do disestablishment of the church because <laughs> then we could talk about anti-disestablishmentarianism which as we all know split parliament uh, in the past <laughs> although it's a long time ago and that'll be for another day it That's was a day, little bit of yeah <laughs> let's have a look at this headline in the sun um simon clark former leveling up secretary under liz Trust has written this. Scrapping housing plans would lose Tories millions of voters forever and destroy the market. Simon Clark says the Conservative Party is at its most successful when it puts the dream of home ownership at the heart of what it offers to the electorate. Uh, Theresa, are you not standing in the way of that ambition and core part of conservatism with your amendment to scrap those mandatory housing targets? Well, not at all. And, and I have a huge regard for Simon Clark, but only <laughs> six weeks ago, who was going around saying we must get rid of these Stalinist top-down housing <laughs> targets. So that slightly undermines the weight of to be given to his article. We do need to build more homes, and we are building a significant number in this country, but there is the targets are depriving local communities of decision-making. They're also disproportionately focusing on the crowded south of England. There are better ways to deliver new homes, 
and to deliver them in a way that which is more sustainable, which is supported mm. by greater infrastructure, not least in our in our cities and towns across the Midlands and the north of England, where new homes can be a brilliant part of the regeneration project we want to come with levelling up. Yeah, but do you accept that by scrapping mandatory targets, telling local authorities in areas across the country how many homes to build will lead to fewer houses being built? I, I think that uh, it may have some impact on right. the number of homes built, but actually, I, I, if you set a more reasonable target oh. or you give local communities mm -hmm. power and agency over what is built in their neighbourhood, I think they will step up. It, it's the problem of when when the housing is is rammed into an in, into communities in an insensitive way, not supported by infrastructure, and in a way which damages in the environment. Of future generations right. will not thank us for destruction of the natural environment, which comes sometimes with insensitive housing terms. I mean, is this just going to make it harder for younger people to get on the housing ladder in any shape, sense or form? Well, it is. I think it is. And, uh, you know, you make com completely valid points about the the worries that locals have with building in their own area. And it is an issue that, you know, we've talked about for many years and decades uh, in British politics. Um, but, but the idea that, it's, you know, as a young person looking at the mm. Conservative Party and looking at, at a party that is going to make house building trickier, not easier, is going to be something that will damage the Conservative Party brand. And as Simon Clark speaks out in his article, he mentions Margaret Thatcher and the, that she, you know, the things that she did to make uh, young people able to buy a home easier was a key part of that electoral success. And obviously it's getting harder and harder. And I think you know, obviously locals do have legitimate concerns. And, you know, perhaps uh, would it would it not be uh, easier to sort of try and tweak that and, you know, put some sort of local protections in place rather than scrapping them all together? Is that something you might be willing to, to look at? Well, I, I want to see these targets go, but obviously, you know, any improvements to the current system would be welcome. But it it, it is just the case that, you know, the targets are an insensitive way to, to drive home building. And, and as a result, local communities and their elected representatives are increasingly disempowered and are forced to accept development, which is wholly out of character with the neighbourhood, which loses green fields, whereas we should have a stronger focus on derelict industrial land, other brownfield sites. Uh, we can deliver these homes, but without the destruction which is coming with these targets. But is the Conservative Party turning its back on younger voters? I mean, Simon Clark is saying they're going to lose millions of voters forever. Yeah, I mean, I, I mm. think so. I think that, that's fair. And I think when you when you look at Sun Regis specifically, quite a lot of them are renters, actually. And I, mm -hmm. I didn't know this looking at some of our, our sort of statistics on who reads our paper. A lot of them are renters and looking to buy. It's not all mortgage owners. And I think that is a, a really key part of the next election is going to be house building, definitely. Uh, Lloyd? I, I mean, we've seen house ownership plummet under this government. Um, and probably over actually 20 years, so over, over other governments as well, because we've not built enough houses. We've thought that the private rented sector is a solution. It is not. No one should be in the private rented sector in the long term. They either need permanency in social and council housing or permanency in, in home ownership. And, 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 and what we need is house building. And we need it in the green belt. We need it on green patches of land. Oh. I'm fed up with people saying, no, I want our cities to be more crowded. I want our towns to be more crowded. Please build on urban sites. No, we need to build towns and cities on green land. A tiny proportion of our land is built okay. on in this country. If you took all the housing stock, you could fit it in the golf courses of all of our country. That is a disgrace. And actually, I think the targets should go up. But what should also happen at the well, same time is I mean, local authorities should be empowered to be able to make proactive well, stances at the beginning. Because what happens at the moment is local authorities have to wait for a developer to come along. And then Theresa's right. The developer proposes only high-end houses that are totally inappropriate for the area. If, like my, the house that my, I grew up in, the local authority built the roads, they built the school, they built the infrastructure, and they sold off the little plots for people to be able to buy. That almost doesn't happen now because local authorities have been gutted for many funds to be able to build infrastructure first. All right. Because what now happens is that you have to have the building first and then the infrastructure levy comes and it's too late for people to be able to start to feel that they have had an improvement in their local area. So yes, the system needs to change, but the housing targets are not the problem. The problem is the way that the system is designed and that local authorities right. are hands well, off. Theresa, build on the green belt. Has he convinced you? No, he hasn't. I think that would be hugely environmentally destructive and I would strongly oppose that. Uh, would you build on the South Downs then? 
I would build on parts of the South Downs, yes. Some of those villages could double in size quite easily. Well, it's quite interesting uh, hearing, um, first of all, Theresa very much sticking to her guns. Um, and there's a political point mm. uh, about losing votes. But also, yes, build on the green belt. Yes, build on parts of the green belt. Um, uh, the idea that the green belt parts. should all be sacrosanct, I think, is is, is nonsense. All of the green belt is not of, of equal uh, value for future generations. Trees and, and houses and housing is. I was quite. I thought it was slightly bizarre thing that Lloyd just said was that no one should be in the private rented sector uh, for all of their lives or a long time. But why not, Lloyd? If it is well regulated, it's the way most of Europe does its housing. Germany, and you will certainly not be able to produce enough uh, unless you've got a magic wand that I'm not aware of. Council and social housing to fit demand. So two things need to happen is the rental sector needs to work better. It needs to be incentivised for good landlords to be able to rent long term as ways still many of my friends who are professional people live in, in Germany for one example, the Netherlands for another and others. So I do well, think we're getting off track here when we try Britain. to say at the centre this is how you should live and, and build. But if you go Home away from bigger the targets, in Germany than Britain. this is why Simon Clark has uh, changed his tune somewhat, yeah. is the government knows, mm -hmm. yeah. Rishi Sunak knows, yeah. that yeah. He, he is on the line here and going with this dim sum menu in which you all decide what you might yeah. like to sign up to is endangering the government's reputation on housing. But, but this is the problem, actually, you've touched on it there. This is weakness of Rishi Sunak. Yes. We've seen this yeah. repeatedly. Rishi Sunak is now threatened that he's having to pull the levelling up bill <laughs> because he's scared that he can't, uh, can't get it through. He is a Prime Minister with a majority of 60, but he's acting like he's got a majority of two. Lloyd, this is about parliamentary scrutiny. This is about making sure this bill works both for the environment and for home building. And I, I would point out, you criticise the Conservatives for, in your view, not building enough homes. We're building about three times as many homes as Labour did when they when they. I think I said over 20 years there have been failures. I acknowledge that it's success, all Successive governments have not yes. built enough homes and there is the point about the private rented sector. But the crisis sector is, is, now. Not actually, is not actually in a state to no. provide the sorts of homes you were not... But actually, well Michael Gove has brought forward really revolutionary uh, reforms, proposals on the private rented sector, but the government won't give it time to come forward. But you the just said you didn't want anyone in it. No, no, I don't want people well, in it, stuck in it for the long term. The charge, though, is that you are going to lose out politically, Theresa. Is Simon Clark right that you are going to lose millions of young voters? You're sacrificing the young for focus and concentration on older voters. I do not accept that. We have a strong offer for young people, and yeah. that includes building new homes. But we just have not to have the many, right, just not the as right many as homes in the like. right places and we have to look to deliver them in an environmentally sustainable way in tune with the character of the neighbourhood and the people who live there. I, just, I also just wanted to point out, I do agree with Theresa on your land banking amendments as well. I think mm. that's a very important point which we haven't really touched on. The fact yeah. is that there are so many houses that developers sit on that land and are not built on it. It's already approved. We've already had the argument. So that's all arguments already been won. Um, inappropriate areas, and those houses just aren't being built quick enough. Right. I mean, just uh, briefly, are you supporting, um, or not supporting, I should say, Theresa Villiers' amendment about getting rid of targets? Well, I'm not, I'm not personally supporting no. it. My understanding is that the Labour Party is not supporting getting rid of targets, but, you know, I'm always, always uh, willing to be corrected. I think what we do support is some of the stuff around land banking, and we put that in our last two manifestos, in fact, to say that yeah. we would require developers to use the land that they had uh, land banked, um, and if they didn't, they would lose it. What about the triple lock? Uh, the triple lock uh, for pensioners, mm -hmm. Anne. Um, I mean, there's been a huge debate around it, but in the end, the government has come out and said it will increase uh, pensions in line with inflation set at that point at about 10%. Labour supports it too. Is that a contentious policy when it comes to sacrificing younger voters, paying for older voters or not? I, I, don't, I, I don't really feel about the, the triple lock as, as badly as, as some people do. When you look at the fact that our pensions are relatively low and if you look at you know, what people get back, if you had a contributory system like a lot of continental Europe, a lot of people would be doing much better out of the pension system. More cynically, Joe, you can say, well, you know, here is this group who are likely to continue to vote Tory, because I don't think that, uh, that the Conservatives at the moment uh, have a really good offer for younger voters, or indeed for those who are not very, very young. You know, I'm not talking about people who are out there in the hot pants. I mean, I mean people who are really, you know, in starting 30s, yeah. families. Yes, yeah. uh, I think this is the big problem for the Conservatives. So, in a sense, you're robbing Peter to pay 
pool with, with the triple lock, but it's interesting, isn't it, that Labour hasn't really gone into battle on it. Why? Because I think they also know that that pension vote you know, is an important one. Uh, it's important that you mention housing and pensions, though, because a lot of the poor state of our private rented sector and housing is because people didn't have trust yeah. in their pensions and they invested in small time right. one or two houses. Mm. They're not usually very good landlords. Good, good landlords are usually, as you have in Europe, institutional investors. They run lots of housing. They run them as professional operations. And so what we also need to do is find a way for those one or two household landlords to get out of the market but get a good return for that, invest their money in a different vehicle mm. and then repurpose those houses into to buy council housing or a different form of private rented sector that is about permanency and that is not about the current private rented sector which is about temporariness. Uh, your colleague uh, Theresa Villiers, Sir Charles Walker, Conservative MP, says there needs to be a quid pro quo for younger mm -hmm. generations, for looking after, as he says, the elderly. Do you agree? Yeah, well, yes, in many ways. And our programme of support with the cost of living obviously benefits all generations. The energy price guarantee is, is crucial but in terms of something tackling specific household bills for younger for young young generations people. to hold well, on to. Well, in the autumn statement, the, the Chancellor allocated nearly five billion extra for schools and education, mm -hmm. recognising that we have to have a balanced approach which is fair to all generations. Yes, but that's child, true. That childcare still not being sorted, which affects uh, mainly younger people. If we're talking about young being under 40, I think mm -hmm. is what kind of the yeah. definition we're using at the moment. If you look at people in the private rented sector again, they weren't eligible, lots of them, for some of that financial support for household bills because they are secondary metered and they don't have a relationship with the energy company. If you look at the changes on voter ID, for example, young persons bus passes, young persons rail passes, not accepted for voter ID, but old persons persons bus passes and rail cars from the mm. same operator accepted for voter ID. Yes. There is clearly a policy in the Conservative Party to undermine young people ah. and then to disenfranchise well, young people so it doesn't matter well, because Therese, they won't even get a well, vote. Well, that's quite a charge, Theresa. Well, that, that's just nonsense. Well, that's voter, what's happening. voter ID is about cracking down on voter fraud. Well, then everyone, accept voter everyone ID from the, the same operator. ID accept so voter ID vote. from the same operator if a railway company has given an old person and a young person voter ID. Accept both for a vote, but you don't at the moment because it is discrimination. Are they the enemies of aspiration for young people? I think the Conservative Party is offer for young people should be stepped up completely and, and yeah I think that you know, it's not just housing like Lloyd mentions it's childcare it's the pensions offer as well I mean I think young people will rightly look at the policies on offer and think what am I being offered by the Conservative Party and that is something that Rishi Sunak is going to have to get to grips with um, you know he's saying that his priorities in the next um, you know sort of six months eight to, uh, to a year are sort of focusing on things like tackling uh, illegal immigration and getting the economy sorted no, it's not that young people don't care about those issues it's just they care about other issues too they mm. care about being able to buy a house they care about being able to afford to start a family uh, they care about childcare um, and, and that offer just I just don't think is there for the Conservative Party at the moment. But sorting out the economy is, is just crucial for young people's opportunities as is the, the massive programme of improving skills which mm. is, is there to give young people and older people opportunities to get the high paid work that they want but and what? also everything that we do in terms of getting inflation down oh. getting mortgage rates under control is absolutely vital for giving young people the good start in life that they deserve and briefly we don't really hear anything much decisive from the government on education and if there's one thing I think which people can agree on whether they're young themselves or they're starting and bringing up families is that that is decisive it's obviously an area where we've seen a lot of shifts and changes in the, the system I'm talking about education in England obviously the you know, differences in Scotland and Wales but nonetheless it doesn't feel like it's central and that, that perplexes me a bit about Rishi Sunak because I think he is now naturally a meritocrat. He's very driven for a lot of people to do well. He, he thinks that's important to a society. And yet you've got a fairly kind of lame education. I mean, most people honestly cannot remember what Tory education policy is right now. And I think that is another area we haven't uh, touched on. But if, uh, to, to the, the point you were making, if you want to signal importance mm. about what happens to the generations, well, looking like you're serious about getting a better education system that, that's uh, broader, fairer and better is really the, the way to go. You mentioned Rishi Sunak of course, we have Prime Minister's questions in just over 10 minutes' time. But first of all, listen to this. It happened in Parliament yesterday. When the occupants are ousted from the Ukrainian land, when our people can return home, the world will be able to thank Britain for not only helping to stop evil on the battlefield, 
but also for helping to restore justice by condemning and punishing this evil. I believe it will happen. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Slava Ukraini. The First Lady of Ukraine there, Alenska, Elena Zelenska, I should say. Um, you saw sitting next to her there the Speaker of the House of Commons, Sir Lindsay Hoyle. He said that her visit must shock us awake again. Uh, do we need to be shocked awake again? I think probably we do. It is important to remember the, the shocking crisis in, in, um, in Ukraine. And we also obviously need to focus on ensuring we continue to look after the Ukrainian refugees that we're hosting in this country. Uh, is fatigue, Ukraine fatigue, setting in amongst your constituents or not, Lindsay? Well, Lindsay, think... sorry. <laughs> Lloyd. I'm not quite Lindsay Hoyle yet. No, not but, yet. Um, in a few more decades, I think, to get to that stage. Look, the... Set your ambition. The, um, <laughs> the, there is always a danger in long-running conflicts mm. that people lose focus. Um, and, but the reality is that we need to be um, totally clear that Russia must fail and Ukraine must succeed. And it's not about Russia and Ukraine, actually. Already now we have a war uh, burdening on the Turkish-Syrian border where Turkey is invading up to two kilometres, they're proposing, into Syrian territory that they will annex. You, of course, have the... Pro and Turkey's an ally. Mm. You have, of course, China and Taiwan. The danger is if... Russia is shown to succeed, that it can change international borders through force, allies and non-allies will start to get a glint in their eye and those long-running little areas that they wanted to invade but haven't quite done, they will do so. So there is an imperative for wider world stability that we make this win. The question then is, how do you win? Because I think Russia will fight like a dog till the end. And so that means that we need to either be braced for a very long war, that we grind Russia down, the losses are so big for Russia that it's the Russian people saying we need to withdraw. That requires a long-term support. Or we have to escalate it, but the dangers there, of course, are, are literally annihilation. So All it's right. very difficult choices that we make. All but right, well, we must well, I, be solid with Ukraine and with the, the, the armaments that they need. Anne? Well, just as a former kind of Moscow mm. person, you know, obviously <coughs> during the, the rise of point, I agree with a large amount of what, what Lloyd has said. That Ukraine has to win and be seen to win. It means I don't think we can kind of entirely pick and choose. You know, we have to be on the side of Ukraine. When you say uh, escalation could lead to annihilation, I think that is well overcooked. I think we're well, well short Maybe. of that as a as a risk. But, you know, you're, you're, you're right to be, be wary about it. One thing I can sort of guarantee, and I'm, I'm not the only person who said this, you know, it, Vladimir Putin will go for a long war because that's how he thinks it will um, grind us down in a difficult winter in Europe. Just going to interrupt briefly to welcome viewers from the BBC News Channel. We are talking about the visit of Ukraine's First Lady yesterday. Uh, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, the Speaker in the House of Commons, said uh, in his remarks that her visit must shock us awake again. Anne, sorry, just to continue on your thoughts there, do you think we do need to be shocked uh, awake again in terms of support? Well, I have to say, I think if you look at the international compact the UK is doing pretty well actually the political class is very solid I've been in America where I think there are many more schisms around the Biden administration and a slight sense that they're getting a bit bored with it and would like and we saw one of the generals Mark Milley come out and say that or the Pentagon uh, general uh, I thought that was a dangerous moment it was closed down pretty quickly continentally we know that there are fissures on how far to go to support Ukraine so I think Britain on this sense I'm not you know for the pat on the back complacency model here but I think we're doing pretty well what I can guarantee is we will come under more pressure. There will be a propaganda assault on, on Britain uh, from the Kremlin, precisely because we're such a solid ally. So it's not so much me shocking awake. Mm. It's that bit in the marathon, you know, when you're at the, the 13K and you've got the other 13 uh, ahead. <laughs> well, thankfully, you have I to don't keep know going. quite that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm talking like I do. <laughs> There's a danger with too much shock therapy. Yeah. What happens is people get muted to it later on. So yes. it does need to also be constant, not just, uh, not just scare stories. Doesn't. Natasha, briefly. I think we do need to remember, though, uh, the people at home and sort of their everyday lives will not, sadly, be dominated by this war. It is not that people in Britain do not care. We know how generous they are in opening their homes to the hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian refugees that have come to this country. Um, but people trying to put food on the table, trying to pay their um, mortgages, 
Um, it might not be their first priority. Um, I think what the government and, to be fair to the opposition, have done incredibly well is link those two things together. Your inflation is mm. going up because of the cost of energy, because of the war in Ukraine. That helps keep things at the front of people's minds uh, and makes people realise that these, these two things are linked and, um, you know, we can tackle them together. Let's introduce Chris Mason, the BBC's political editor, as we have just over five minutes till Prime Minister's questions. We spoke last week, Chris, about both Sir Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak sort of finding a groove um, mm. and hitting their stride, which they seem to, to some extent. Now Rishi Sunak is facing uh, rebellions on many fronts. We talked about one here with our guests when it came to housing targets. Uh, there's also onshore wind, approach to China and so on and so forth. What is the mood, do you think, in the Conservative Party? I think there's a chance, you know, that the whole housing question might just feature in the next half hour. As far as mood in the Conservative Party is concerned, I think it's two things. One is a kind of relief uh, that, th that there's a certain sense of stability, that we're not in a conversation, the kind of perennial conversation mm. of 2022, which was basically how long will the government last? That was the recurring question with various prime ministers, wasn't it, during the course of much yeah. of this year? That's kind of calmed down but then the, the coming question is one of can Rishi Sunak get stuff done yes. and there's the beginning of a thought that maybe mm. that will prove tricky whether it be you know around questions of housing or there's the question as you say around uh, onshore wind uh, and then there's the, the the coming question if you like as far as Labour are concerned which mm. is what do they stand for as they try and present themselves as a an alternative government I wonder for instance if the whole question around private schools and charitable status, something that uh, the Daily Mail has been getting excited about in the last couple of days as far as Labour's prospectus is concerned, mm. uh, might just feature as well. Right. In terms of a distinct message, um, there has been, as you say, uh, quite a bit of commentary about how much of a difference there is between the Conservative and Labour offer at the moment, or that people can't see it clearly enough. Yeah, I think there's a, there is a bit of that. And I think, why is that the case? Well, I think partly it's because Rishi Sunak's trying to find his feet and work out what he might be able to get through. In other words, what his backbenchers might be able to live with. And then from Keir Starmer's perspective, I think there is a desire for him and the front bench of Labour to start doing stuff where that not just in a kind of reactive space, responding to what the government's doing, but rather setting out their own agenda. But at the same time, not from their perspective, doing too much of that it, when we could be still quite a way out from a general election. So I think that's why you've had, if you like, I think at PMQs last week, something of a nil-nil draw, to be, to be honest. And mm. uh, that sort of sense of, it's not mid-term anymore, but equally we're not kind of in the hurtling in, towards an immediate general election as far as most people see it. And so you see this element of shadow boxing playing out as both try and work out the measure of each other and the measure of their own parties and the measure of where we are likely to be uh, in the electoral cycle. Well, to refer back to uh, potential rebellions, uh, former Cabinet Minister Jacob Rees-Mogg has told Conservative Home that rebellions are ill-advised. He was talking on Conservative Home's Mogcast uh, out today. Let's just take a brief listen. I think these rebellions are ill-advised. Um, are they out of control? You've done the studies, you've reported on the studies that rebellion has been getting bigger since the 1950s and seems to be getting further and further. It is harder to stop under current circumstances for a number of reasons, partly um, the mandate. Uh, the mandate is important and the mandate was Boris's and therefore it's hard to turn around and say you must vote for this because it was in the manifesto when inconvenient bits of the manifesto have been, been jettisoned. Chris, I'll come back to you in a minute, but first of all, Theresa, do you think Rishi Sunak is lacking a mandate and therefore cannot push through uh, things that he'd like to because of people like you rebelling? He has a mandate. We got that mandate at the general election. Our parliamentary system means that uh, we've now vested that mandate in, in Rishi. Um, I, turning to rebellions, it's, it's not something that I engage in very often. I mean, for me on the housing question, it's just so crucial for my constituency. I felt that I had to table these amendments, but I am also very much wanting to try and find some kind of negotiated solution, which means that we don't have to put the amendments to a vote. Right. But I, I also believe that MPs do need to stand up for their constituents. And mm. sometimes that means speaking out against what the government is doing and trying to change the approach taken by the government. I mean, that will be an argument, no doubt, Chris, put by many other Conservative MPs because uh, what Theresa Villiers is uh, rebelling on was part of the manifesto, I think, in 2019. 
Yeah, and this is where you get back to that whole question that Jacob Rees-Mogg was reflecting on around the question of mandate. And we saw, didn't we, Rishi Sunak trying to own that mandate in his uh, words in Downing Street when he became Prime Minister, saying, look, it was a Conservative mandate, it wasn't a Boris Johnson mandate. You hear Mr Rees-Mogg making an argument that is a little uh, different from that. So, yeah, you're going to see, I think, and we see it already, uh, the reality for Downing Street that the majority, notionally, that the Conservatives have doesn't seem that big if you're sitting in Downing Street and mm. hearing noises off, whether it be on housing targets or on energy generation or on, or on plenty of other things. And I think as you see a general election, uh, you know, appear on the horizon and get closer, you'll see Conservative MPs perhaps nervous about retaining their seats, being mm. willing to be more independent minded in public. Anne? I'm just amused by the fact that everybody thinks their rebellion is the right mm. one. And Theresa never rebels except on this. Jacob <laughs> Rees-Mogg thinks this is all very regrettable, but in fact was, you know, was quite big on the old rebellion, wasn't he, you know, when it came to the aftermath of 2016. So you come back to the fact is, can the centre hold, you know, can the Prime Minister somehow get a grip on this? Of course the lack of a mandate is a problem, but that's the way politics has worked out. And I think at some point he has to face down his party and say, look, either you agree to be led by me, I, you know, I can't be led by all of you. That is really, I think, the way to absolute electoral disaster for the Conservatives. I think that is Rishi, Rishi Sunak's now biggest uh, task, is to define who he is, what he stands for, and what he's going to try and, and get his premiership to achieve. And, and at the moment, we really don't know what that might, what might look like. I mean, we know, don't we, Sir Keir Starmer has dropped most of his uh, leadership uh, platform that he stood on to become leader of the Labour Party. Um, is that a problem? Well, I, I think that uh, a lot of the policies, once they come out from Labour, actually are um, generally what he pledged and what he promised. But well, of course, there is, there, there, there is spin and discussion around... Hasn't he admitted himself that he's essentially ripped up the Labour's well, manifesto and stuff? Well, what, yes. they, what they said is, we've ripped up the Labour manifesto and we're going to launch a set of policies. And so far, the key policies that they've launched but, are all similar policies. So it we is, shouldn't believe a word, really, no, no, should no, we, that's it's, written it's, either in a manifesto it's, or even it's, on a leadership it's, it's platform? It's what it is so far far and I would like him to uh, admit to more of what he promised in the leadership, like uniting the party. But what he has done so far, in, 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 which I think we, we, we have done uh, and still got more work to do, but I think what he's done so far is shown that credible leadership right. um, is, uh, is got positive. To, we're going into PMQs. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I'm sure colleagues from around the House will want to join me in congratulating England on last night. Yeah. Commending Wales for inspiring millions uh, and also wishing everyone a happy St Andrew's Day. Uh, Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial... In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Tommy Shepherd. In 2014, his predecessor David Cameron signed up to the Smith Commission, which promised, amongst other things, that nothing in its report would prevent Scotland becoming an independent country should the people of Scotland so choose. Can I ask the Prime Minister, does he share that view? And if he does, and in light of last week's Supreme Court judgment, will he bring forward legislation to allow that choice to be exercised? Yeah. 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 Minister. Well, I, Mr Speaker, we, we did have that conversation uh, not so many years ago. It was described as a once-in-a-generation referendum. But, and we discussed this last week. I think what the people of Scotland want is for us to be working constructively together to focus on their priorities. That's indeed what we're doing in his own area, investing hundreds of millions of pounds in a growth deal and ensuring that with a new concert hall we can enshrine Edinburgh's reputation as a city of culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've just returned from the South Pacific and I found there a deep. I've resisted the all black jokes, Mr. Speaker. But I found there a deep concern at the expanding tentacles of communist China. Would my right honourable friend agree with me that China is more than just, as he put it, a systemic challenge, but in fact an expanding, serious geopolitical threat? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. 
Mr Speaker, China is indeed a country with fundamentally different values to ours and an authoritarian leadership intent on reshaping the international order. But actions speak louder than words, and that is why we passed the new National Security and Investment Act. Just recently, we used that act to block the sale of Newport Wafer Fab. And this week, with our announcement of Sizewell C, we ensured that China's state-owned Nuclear Energy Corporation will no longer be a part of the project. This government making sure that we protect our country's security. Yeah. 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 the Leader of the Opposition, Kirstama. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. May I join the Prime Minister in saying, well done, England. And I hope we can say that next week and the week after. Yeah, yeah. Commiserations to Wales, so I'm sure we'll be back in the World Cup tournament yeah, before yeah, too long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, Mr. Speaker, we mark that tomorrow is World AIDS Day. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Winchester College has a rowing club, a rifle club, an extensive art collection. They charge over £45,000 a year in fees. Why did he hand them nearly £6 million of taxpayers' money this year in what his levelling up secretary calls egregious state support? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased he wants to talk about schools because we've recently announced billions more funding for our schools. We're, we're helping millions of the most disadvantaged children catch up with their lost learning. And we're driving up school standards, Mr. Speaker. But during COVID, during COVID, he wanted to keep schools closed. We shouldn't be surprised because I listen to parents and he listens to his union paymasters. Mr. Speaker, he's levelling up secretary. I see him down there, who, after all, was education secretary for four years said you could scarcely find a better way of ending burning injustices than scrapping these hands out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here's why, and he talks about driving up standards. Just down the road in Southampton, and he'll know this, four in every ten pupils fail their English or Maths GCSE yeah, yeah. this year. Four in ten. Is that £6 million of taxpayers' money better spent on rifle ranges in Winchester or driving up standards in Southampton? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, Mr. Speaker, he, he talks about school standards. It's under, it's, it's under a Conservative government, and thanks to the reforms of the former Education Secretary, that now almost 90% of schools are good or outstanding. But Mr. Speaker, when, Mr. Speaker, whenever, whenever, Mr. Speaker, whenever he attacks me about where I went to school, he is attacking the hard-working aspiration of millions of people in this country. He's attacking people like my parents, Mr. Speaker. This is a country that believes in opportunity, not resentment. He doesn't understand that, and that's why he's not fit to lead. Mr. Speaker, if he thinks the route to better education in this country is tax breaks for private schools in the hope they might hand that sum that down to state schools, that's laughable. Trickle down education is nonsense. And Mr. Speaker, it's not just the levelling up secretary. His education minister sitting there asks, how much better would it be if Conservatives got rid of these handouts? Yeah, yeah. He talks about his record. It's simple. He can carry on being pushed around by the lobbyists, yeah. giving away £1.7 billion to private schools every year, or we can put that money to good use. Yeah. End the Tory scandal. He talks about his record. Hundreds of thousands of children leaving school without the qualifications that they need. I've made my choice. What's his? Prime Minister. Mr. Mr. Speaker, we're improving school standards for every pupil in this country. It's our reforms that are leading to us marching up the PISA league tables for reading, for writing, more good and outstanding schools, more investment in every single school. But he talks about choice. This is about supporting aspiration, Mr. Speaker, and that's what this government is proud to do. Yes, Mr. Speaker, he really does need to get out more. Yeah. And he, talk, he talks about aspiration. Mr. Speaker, they are killing off aspiration in this country. And it's not just education. 
Why is the dream of home ownership far more remote now than it was when his party came into power 12 years ago? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, what have we done in those 12 years? The highest, the highest number of new homes started in 15 years. Yeah. Largest, largest number of first-time buyers in 20 years. Yeah. He, ta- he talked about 10 years ago. What do we inherit? The lowest level of house building in a century. Yeah. Mr Speaker, would you believe it? Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker the simple fact is this. Every year, the age at which people can buy their first home goes up. At this rate, under this government, a child born in the UK today wouldn't be able to buy their first home until they're 45. Now, I love my kids, but I don't want to cook them dinner in 30 years' time. (laughs) Now, Mr Speaker, I've heard... I've heard... I've heard he... I've heard he's having a relaunch. Apparently, it's called... Operation Get Tough. So, so how tough is he going to get with his backbenchers who are blocking the new homes this country so badly needs? Prime Minister! Uh, Mr Speaker, we're delivering record numbers of new homes under this government. That's what we're doing. He talks talks about toughness, Mr Speaker. He's too weak to stop dozens of his own MPs joining the picket lines. So if he wants to support support those hard-working families and show some leadership, why doesn't he confirm right now that no Labour MPs are going to join those picket lines? Mr Speaker, whichever way you slice it, it's always the same whether it's private schools, oil giants, or those who don't pay their taxes here, every week he hands out cash to those that don't need it. Every week he gets pushed around, and every week he gets weaker. But I can help him with this one. He doesn't need to do another grubby deal if he wants to defeat that amendment from his anti-growth backbenchers on national targets for housing. Labour will lend him the votes to do so. Country before party, that's the Labour way. Why doesn't he try it? Mr. Speaker, I I think I think we we did we we did hear too too weak to confirm no one on the picket line. But Mr Speaker, it's the same old Labour ideas. More debt, more inflation, more strikes and more migration. He's too he tells his party what they want to hear. I'll take the difficult decisions for this country. And that's the choice, Mr Speaker. It's the politics of yesterday with him or the future of the country with me. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As host of this week's international PSVI conference, the UK again highlighted the need for more action to prevent sexual violence in conflict. With heartrending accounts of women in Ukraine being brutalised in this way and reports that a third of women in conflict zones can be victims, will the Prime Minister champion with me as his special envoy for freedom of religion or belief the work being undertaken with young people across the world to prevent religion or belief being weaponised, which can later manifest into sexual violence in conflict. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Councillor, I'm incredibly grateful to my honourable friend for her dedicated work in this area. And she's absolutely right to, to highlight that this week the UK hosted the Preventing Sexual Violence in Conflict Initiative Conference. Uh, it was an incredible success. I pay tribute to all those involved. And as she said, uh, we managed to reach a new political declaration in the conference where over 50 different countries have agreed to put an end to sexual violence in conflict. And she deserves praise for all her work in this area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The SNP, Ian Blackford. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm sure the whole House will want to join me in sending prayers and condolences to the wife of Doddy Weir, who sadly passed away at the weekend. The absolute giant of a man, an inspirational figure in Scottish rugby, and someone who raised £8 million for MND charities over the course of the last six years. Our thoughts and prayers are with Cathy, with Hamish, with Angus and with Ben. Mr Speaker, let me wish everyone a happy St Andrew's Day. And those that know anything about St Andrew 
know that he's not just the patron of Scotland, he's celebrated right across Europe. That is why it is such a sad sight to watch this Prime Minister ram through a bill that would rip up 4,000 pieces of European law. Laws that protect workers' rights, food standards and environmental protections. And it's an even worse sight watching the leader of the Labour Party desperately trying to out-Brexit the Prime Minister. Really out freedom of movement and any hope of a Swiss-style deal. Brexit is now the elephant in the room that neither the Tories or Labour are willing to confront. When will the Prime Minister finally see reality and admit that Brexit is a significant long-term cause of the UK economic crisis? Well, Mr Speaker, can I start by joining my honourable friend in offering our condolences to the family and friends of Doddy Weir, and I'd also like to pay tribute to him for his campaign to raise awareness of MND, uh, which has made a big difference. Now, Mr Speaker, straightforwardly, I was proud to support Brexit. It was the right thing for this country. It, allow, it, allow, it allows us to, first of all, get control of our borders, which is incredibly important, and reduce migration, all of which, Mr Speaker, I know... The, uh, I, 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 I noticed what he said, and I agree with him, actually, about the slight dexterity of the Leader of the Opposition on these, uh, on these topics of free movement. And I know he'll join me in reminding the Leader of Opposition about his previous promise to defend free movement of people, not something that we support, Mr Speaker. But we're also seizing the economic opportunities, deregulating and signing trade deals around the world. That's how we'll drive growth and prosperity. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the... Prime Minister for his remarks on Doddy Beer, but once again, what we're seeing over Brexit is better together. We're used to that in Scotland. Yep. The problem for both the Prime Minister and the Labour leader is that when it comes to Brexit, even their own voters don't agree with them. The last YouGov poll showed that a record 56% now believe it was wrong to leave the European yep. Union, and that figure is 71% in Scotland. One in five who actually voted for Brexit have now changed their minds. More and more people across these islands are wise to the fact that make Brexit work is just another stupid slogan. But Scotland can't be stuck with a new Brexit together coalition of the Tories and Labour. So on this St Andrews Day, can the Prime Minister finally tell people in Scotland the democratic path to escape Westminster control, to deliver independence so we can get back to the European Union? Mr Speaker, he, he, talks, he talks about democracy and votes. I think the difference between him and I is that I respect the result of referendums. Yeah. And he, he, he talks about this. Let's just remember one thing, Mr Speaker. We had the fastest vaccine rollout in the world. We had that because of our freedoms after leaving the European yeah. Union. Well, Palsy. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, manufacturing remains a key part of the UK economy and for the West Midlands, that means automotive. That's important in my constituency of rugby, which includes firms in the supply chain and workers at Jaguar Land Rover. With the move to all new cars sold in the UK to become electric by 2030, means that which is critical for us to have a site for battery manufacture. Yeah. Assembly is already taking place elsewhere in the world where batteries are made. So will the Prime Minister give his support to the bid for a gigafactory in yeah. Coventry? Yeah. Prime Minister. So I pay tribute to my honourable friend's efforts to progress this project. We're fully committed, Mr Speaker, to securing investment to grow our electric vehicle supply chain. Uh, now, although he'll know I can't comment on individual commercial negotiations, we did announce in the Net Zero Strategy £350 million of funding in the Automotive Transformation Fund to support the development of that supply chain, and I wish him every success in his bid. Call the base, well. Yesterday, BBC Northern Ireland announced cuts to programming and jobs at BBC Radio Foil that, in my view, will leave the station totally unsustainable. The BBC Charter places uh, an obligation on that organisation to allow audiences to fully engage on local uh, issues. This decision, in my view, is a very clear breach of that obligation. Leaving licence fee payers outside the Greater Belfast area without proper local programming. Will the Prime Minister act to defend this very important local public broadcasting service? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I believe very strongly in local public broadcasting and indeed the government has taken steps to support uh, local media. I'd be very happy to look at the specific issue he raises and uh, bring it up with the BBC when I next see them. Angela Richards. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the people of Guildford tell me they want women and girls to feel safe, and I'm delighted to have had some successes in getting lights turned back on, including on York East Bridge on behalf of concerned students at the University of Study, Surrey. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that even in difficult times we cannot take a single step back from the brilliant work this Conservative Government is doing to tackle violence against women and girls? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, like my honourable friend, the Government is committed to tackling violence against women and girls and making our streets safer. Uh, we've created the Safer Streets Fund, which funds additional patrols, extra lighting and more CCTV. And indeed, the Street Safe Online tool allows users, including those in her constituency, to pinpoint locations where they feel unsafe so that the local police can take appropriate action. And I'll continue to support her in her efforts. I've been up on the sorry. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The two boys, 16 year old boys, Charlie Batalo and Kiani Sianko, were tragically killed in my constituency of Irith and Tansmead this weekend. My heart goes out to the families and friends left behind. We really need to come across the House to address and tackle serious youth violence. So, can I ask the Prime Minister? What he is doing to address knife crime epidemic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. I, uh, I thank the Honourable Lady for her question and join her in expressing my condolences to the family and friends of the two boys. I also read about it. It's an awful tragedy. Um, she rightly asked what we are doing to make our streets safer and stamp out the scourge of night crime. We're boosting the number of police officers, as she'll know, 15,000 on our way to 20,000. And we're also giving them the powers they need to get knives off our streets, including lifting restrictions on stop and search and introducing new court orders to target known knife offenders. I agree with her. This is something we need to do more on, and she should know that the government will be fully committed to tackling it. Gordon Henderson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, when will my right honourable friend government bring forward any emergency legislation that's needed to deport those migrants who came across the channel illegally in small boats and are now being put up in hotels paid for by hard-pressed British taxpayers. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, we are determined to do whatever it takes to break the business model of people smugglers who are causing the needless loss of life of people across the channel and putting unsustainable pressure on our asylum system. Our Nationality and Borders Act, opposed by the party opposite, Mr Speaker, gives us new powers which we fully intend to use and we will take further measures as required to properly control our borders and reduce the number of illegal crossings. And then back, Doddle. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It was sad to see in a video from his Oxford days the future Prime Minister saying he hadn't a single friend who was working class. <laughs> and he's not likely to make any soon, because while he sits on a personal fortune, he's refusing the reasonable demands of nurses, railway workers and many others forced to take industrial action just to make ends meet. Why doesn't he give them the wage increases they need and fund it by making the rich pay the same rate on unearned income as workers have to pay for their hard graft? And whilst he's at it, why not scrap the non dumb tax loophole yeah, that he's yeah, all yeah, too familiar with, yeah, which is costing the public £3.2 billion? Pounds. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I have nothing but admiration and gratitude to our nurses for all the work they do. But, but Mr Speaker, M M Mr. Speaker it, it is simply unreasonable and unaffordable to have a 19 per cent pay rise. Now, if that's what the honourable gentleman thinks is, I'm sure the Labour Party can explain to us how they would pay for that and the impact it would have on inflation. But I tell you this, Mr Speaker, if he really wants to support working people, maybe he should get off the picket line and end the strikes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The train service between Wilmslow in my constituency and London was always hourly, direct and took one hour fifty. Now you'd be very lucky if you got a direct train and uh, the journey time is double or often double. And that's not restricted to strike days, that's day in, day out on Avanti trains. So, can the Prime Minister tell my constituents what the government's going to do to sort this out and get the West, West Coast service back to what it used to be? Because the service at the moment is completely unacceptable. Yeah, well, Mr. 
Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is absolutely right about the unacceptable deterioration in the quality of Avanti service. The Transport Secretary is rightly monitoring and holding them to account. There is a plan to increase the number of trains to 100 additional drivers, Mr Speaker, and restoring the full direct service between Manchester and London. But what this plan needs, Mr Speaker, and I hope the party opposite support it, is trade union cooperation. Lira Wilson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure members opposite felt a certain sense of déjà vu watching the Welsh defence during last night's match. <laughs> After all, they know what it feels like to uh, have Marcus Rashford run rings round them. Mr Speaker, off the pitch, Marcus Rashford has been a tireless campaigner on child hunger. Yeah. So, uh, in the face of fierce Conservative opposition. Yeah. So, will the Prime Minister, given that he delivered on the pitch last night, will the Prime Minister give him the best thanks possible by delivering free school meals for every child living in poverty? Yeah. 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 Prime Minister. Oh, uh, Mr Speaker, we're supporting almost two million children with free school meals. We also, last year, invested hundreds of millions of pounds in the new Holiday Activity and Food Programme, which is broadening that support through the holidays for those kids who need it, on top of our work to roll out breakfast clubs across the country. Yeah. Blake Drummond. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The pandemic has played havoc with school attendance, and the Children's Commissioner says that almost 115,000 children are now being home-educated, a 34% uh, higher than before the pandemic with little, if any, monitoring of their educational welfare. Mm. Even worse, nine in ten local authorities believe they have not been able to identify home-educated mm. children. So when will my on right honourable friend be bringing forward the register of homeschool children yeah. so they're identified and we can be sure that their needs are looked after and they're not falling through the net? My Minister. Mr Speaker, we support the right of parents to home-educate their children, and we know many do well, but however, this is not the case for all, and that's why local authorities must seek to identify those children missing education. We've published guidance on the arrangements they should be following and indeed make sure that they have oversight of elective home education. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. After record payouts last year to shareholders, the Royal Mail recently this year announced huge half-year losses and plans to cut 10,000 jobs while threatening the cherished universal service obligation, yeah. which guarantees a minimum six-day-a-week letter delivery service in the tradition of the black penny from 1840. Why has his government not yet committed to investigate the mismanagement and cack-handed man mismanagement yeah, yeah. of this iconic British service yeah, yeah. and protecting its future and loyal postal workers? Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, again, I have nothing but gratitude and appreciation for the hard work of our postal workers. But when it, I, 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 it is not the right approach. It is not the right approach to go on strike, especially demanding pay, as we have heard, that is simply unaffordable for hard-working British taxpayers. The Honourable Lady would do well to see that, because in the context that we're in, it is simply not possible to give people the type of pay demands that they are making. Andrew Percy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Due to the unique geography of Brig and Goulin and the Isle of Axum, we are one of the most flood-prone areas of the country. So whilst I welcome the record £5.4 billion of flood defence funding, can I ask, my, uh, ask the Prime Minister, ahead of next year's budget to look at easing the rules around how that money is spent so more of it can be spent on maintenance, which is so important to keeping my constituents dry. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, well, Mr. Mr Speaker, I'm very happy to look at that for my honourable friend. He's right to highlight the doubling of the investment that this government has put in flood defences, but it's right that we get the mix right between that, and I'll take that away with him. Shalene Fletcher. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The West Midlands Chief Constable has revealed that a vulnerable child was forced to spend two days living in a police station during a mental health crisis because the right specialist help could not be found for yeah. them. I know more and more young people are unable to access appropriate support mm. for mental health. Will he accept Labour's plans to scrap private school charitable status yeah, yeah. and use yeah, the money yeah. to fund a mental health professional in every school? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I'd say to the Honourable Lady, we've already committed 
to offer all state schools a grant to train a senior mental health lead by the end of this Parliament. Already six out of ten have doing so. There is funding for all of them to have it. In addition to that, we are increasing the support that we give to those with eating disorders, because she is right, mental health does affect young people. This Government is backing those people to get the support that they need. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The number of people crossing the Channel is a national emergency. The number of migrants in hotels is a national emergency. Isn't it time we had a COBRA-style committee involving the DWP, DLUC, the Home Office, and led by Number 10, to tackle this crisis? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I share my honourable friend's frustration, and I want to reassure him that we will do whatever it takes to reduce the number of illegal crossings to this country, take any new powers that we need to. I look forward to working with him to ensure we can do that, because this is fundamentally about our sovereignty, Mr Speaker, and the proper control of our borders. Whilst the Labour Party have tried to oppose every measure we have taken, we will keep going, because we need to make sure that we stop the crossings. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week, the UK Government's Regulatory Policy Committee stated that the retained EU law bill is not fit for purpose. The Institute for Directors, the TUC and countless others have urged the Government to scrap the bill. And businesses across Scotland have already suffered severe economic damage under this Tory Brexit agenda, and they now see the outlook clouded with even more complexity and uncertainty. If the Prime Minister is serious about protecting the economy and looking after SMEs, why not do the right thing and scrap this disastrous ideological bill now? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, actually taking advantage of our freedoms is going to drive growth and jobs and prosperity in the United Kingdom. Whether it's in life sciences, whether it's reducing the burdens on data for those SMEs, whether it's in the financial services industry in Scotland, that's how we're going to create prosperity across this nation, Mr Speaker, and that's why we're going to get on and deregulate post-Brexit. I'm going to come again, Mr Speaker. My, um, my right honourable friend and the Chancellor have rightly pointed out that levelling up is for the whole of the United Kingdom. And as a Southampton man, my right honourable friend will know that since the 1970s, Eastleigh has been promised a much-needed Chicken Hall Lane bypass. So will he agree to meet me and Hampshire County Council to finally get this project moving? Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, it's right that we spread opportunity across the country, including in Eastleigh and the South. Uh, I understand that it's for Hampshire County Council to bring forward the proposal for the bypass, which I hope they do at the next funding opportunity, and I'll ensure that my honourable friend and the Council have a meeting with the Transport Minister as soon as possible. Final question on Rob. Uh, Thank you, Mr Speaker. Tory ideology has blocked onshore wind development in Scotland for years. Peterhead carbon cu- uh, capture clusters lost out in funding twice and still only classes are a reserve. Pump storage hydro schemes have been blocked because the UK government won't discuss a pricing mechanism. If the Prime Minister actually does care about net zero and cares about Scottish jobs, will at least take action to advance uh, Peterhead CCS and pump storage hydro in Scotland? Prime Minister. Uh, M- Mr Speaker, not only are we supporting in this country carbon capture and storage, hydrogen, offshore wind, all new technologies that will help us get to net zero, all of which will create jobs in Scotland. We are also supporting our transition, Mr Speaker, and that is good for the Scottish economy and it is good for Scottish jobs and something the SNP would do well to support. That completes Prime Minister's questions. And that brings us to the end of this week's Prime Minister's questions. And it was pretty feisty, a little bit of punch and judy, uh, may I say, returning there to the sparring across the dispatch box between uh, Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer. Let's welcome our guest for this part of Politics Live for the government, Paul Scully, uh, Digital Economy Minister from the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, and the Shadow Northern Ireland Secretary, Peter Carl, and Chris Mason. The BBC's political editor is here too. Um, It was very much uh, Keir Starmer leaning in uh, to the issue of private schools and their charitable status. It was very much whose side are you on, Mm. uh, Rishi Sunak, pointing, of course, to the fact that Rishi Sunak went to uh, Winchester College. He used that as an example of a school that has huge resources, perhaps at the expense of the state school system. Then it was the housing uh, targets and the housing issue. What did you make of it all? 
So I thought on, on the private schools thing, it was interesting that Keir Starmer decided to kind of lean into that dividing line. Now, Labour have had that policy for a while about removing charitable status, which would mean that parents who send their children to private schools would be paying VAT on school fees. And there's an argument about what that would then mean in terms of the affordability of some private schools for some parents. Would that mean that they go out of business and then there'd be more children into the state sector? Where does it, where does it end up in terms of the, the kind of benefit or not to the exchequer? But in the political argument, stakes it's one isn't it about fairness and that's mm. so often in the eye or the ear of the beholder and aspiration absolutely I, and so it was quite interesting that after a couple of days where the daily mail has put that issue on its front page it's not surprising you wouldn't expect labor to suddenly abandon the policy but it's interesting that keir starman decided he would proactively pick it mm. as a theme and run with it. And I thought what was striking was that he felt confident to do that, but Rishi Sunak felt confident to say, no, I'm going to defend the idea of aspiration and the idea of parental choice. So it's an interesting divide in line, that. And then on housing and housing targets in England, this is fascinating because you're beginning to see from Labour them trying to build up an argument that portrays the Prime Minister as weak. So that's their, if you like, the theme that they're trying to build. And they're using the housing argument and this whole idea that we were talking about before Prime Minister's questions with uh, Theresa Villas around whether or not it's a good idea to have a housing target or get rid of a house building target in England. And Keir Starmer saying, ah, Rishi Sunak, I'm your mate, really. I'll help you out. Mm. Labour can help you out here. We'll vote with you on this stuff. And therefore, it doesn't matter how many of your backbenchers don't like this stuff, because collectively we'll have a huge majority to get this through. It was striking the Prime Minister ducked that invitation mm. entirely and talked about uh, something not entirely related in the answer. And just briefly, are you pleased about that, that you will be siding with the government on this to, to, to help them get their legislation Sidi through? Siding with Rishi Sunak, not with the government, because it's, it's governing party MPs who are trying to block it. It's to block an amendment which would scupper it. So, yes, we'll put, part, we'll put country first. Rishi Sunak will put country first. Tony Blair several times relied on Tory votes to get key legislation through because he put the country first. Keir Starmer is in that tradition. It is strong leadership leading your party, putting the interests of the country first. And if that's what it takes to get houses built so that people can get on the property ladder, that's what the Labour Party will do. It's really difficult, isn't it, for Rishi Sunak to get stuff through at the moment. He is going to have to probably continually rely on Labour support, despite his notional majority. Well, no, what we have to do is make sure that we get the legislation right so that we can deliver for the country. Uh, um, uh, Peter's absolutely so right Tory in, in, that, in that regard. Who are no, no. Are just... I think what, no, because what it, it is difficult in so much that people have got um, uh, difficult positions in their own constituency, mm. for example. Um, but we've got to make sure that we're making strategic decisions for the country. All right, let's uh, catch up with the uh, Peter Barnes from the Political Research Unit. Let's talk about some of the statistics, Peter, because you always hear housing statistics, uh, who built what when, uh, traded quite often at Prime Minister's questions. Um, what was the truth of it? Well, I, again, with Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer, they're very precise with how they describe their statistics. And as you say, they were trading statistics this week on, on housing as well as the stuff on private schools. And again, like last week, they both said true things. So the question that Keir Starmer put to Rishi Sunak was about the rate of home ownership. He said that home ownership was more remote possibility than it was 12 years ago. And that is certainly true. The proportion of people who own their own homes has declined from a peak of about 71% in 2003. It's now something like 65%. It's quite difficult to get very up-to-date stats on that. But there's clearly been a, a decline in the proportion of people who own their own homes. And Rishi Sunak's counter was to talk about house building. Now, we've heard about this target. They've got 300,000 homes a year in England. There is, they are nowhere near that at the moment. There are nowhere near that many homes being built. But he was able to say that the current government, or at least the number of homes being built in the last year we've got data for, was the highest for 15 years. Right. Now, there are different ways to cut up house, house building stats, but if you look at housing starts, that's the number of new homes that people have started to build, the figure for 2021-22 was just over 174,000, and that was indeed the highest since 2005-06 when it was 183,000. So he, he did have something correct to say about house building going up from its lows, but Keir Starmer was also right that the rate of ownership is much lower than it was in the past. Thank you very much. Uh, just to point could... out that oh. 15 years ago was a Labour government. 
you know, so it's the highest, highest rate he's been building houses since Labour were last in. All right, Peter. Well, thank you for underlining the bit <laughs> of truth there uh, from Keir Starmer. Peter Barnes, thank you to you for looking at those figures. We're going to talk about private schools uh, because, as Chris was saying, this was something that Keir Starmer focused many of his questions on. Labour saying that private schools would no longer be granted their charitable status under a Labour government. The estimate is it amounts to about £3 billion a year to private schools. Um, around 7% of pupils uh, attend those sorts of schools with a dig at Rishi Sunak and his education. Um, let me just show you this in The Times. Michael Gove, he was referenced, in fact, um, Cabinet Minister, put VAT on school fees and soak the rich. This is from 2017. Removing the tax advantages of private schools would boost standards in the state sector and raise vital extra funds. He's right. Actually, I don't think he is. I think one of the first things Tony Blair did was uh, abolish assisted um, places in um, uh, well, 1997. No, no, on no, what so, the but, and there was a, there was a dampening, uh, you know, a lot of debate around the dampening of social mobility. You get to the point now when, of course, we want to increase the standards in uh, in, in the state education system around the country, but economically, I think I don't, I don't think it actually stacks up. Why? Because the first thing that will go. Kiss time talked about Winchester and a lot of the elite schools. Mm. There's a massive chunk of mid range independent schools, especially prep schools and the like, when childcare is very difficult at the moment, that don't charge anywhere near the fees they, they, they got. And they've got a difficult model because they go up to 13 and there's less of a market for that. They will be schools that will close down anyway. Um, because they'll have more failing businesses. There will be the bursaries will go, parents will start from the mid range that the can not the elite rich who mm -hmm. will be insulated from all this will take their children out, put them into the state system. Therefore, you will need more su supply in the state system, not least new schools. Where are you going to get those schools from? Where are you going to get the land to build those schools from? Tell you where the private schools that you've just closed. So actually, you'll be buying the government will literally find themselves buying land from the independent schools that have actually just closed down. So All it'll right. be a circular, um, uh, difficult for the economy, I think. Do you accept that? Are you killing off aspiration, which is the charge <clears throat> that Rishi Sunak put to Keir Starmer for hard-working families and parents, as Rishi Sunak said, who wanted to send their son uh, to a school like Winchester? This is... The, the, the thing that is killing aspiration at the moment is the fact that in the, in the last few years, the gap between state education and private education has doubled. It is now the biggest gap of attainment in the history of our education system. And it is now regional inequalities. There is inequalities between public and private sectors. So mm -hmm. there are now there, there are now so many inequalities emerging. The trends in, in, in uh, education have just fundamentally changed in recent years. Now, w when Labour was in, in 2007, we passed the Charities Act, which removed a third of public schools from charitable status and removed their tax break. That didn't impact at all the numbers of people moving from private schooling into state schooling. The biggest driver of social mobility in this country is state education. We need to make sure it is first rate. The thing that enabled me to move from a comprehensive school in Bognor Regis into the opportunities I've had in my life is the comprehensive school, which I had to go back to when I was 25, incidentally, mm. and then after the fourth application, getting into higher education, getting into a university. It unlocked so much. The state route is the way to get social mobility in there, and we need to make sure that our schools are up to scratch and we can close that gap in attainment between the private sector and the state sector and we do so in a way that gets money into our state sector because right now it is being starved and the, the rate per pupil is not going to match the funding mm. until 2024 that it was when Labour left office in 2010. We've All got right. to do something and it's got to raise, raise money Paul. and it's got to be fair. Paul? Well, I, you know, I understand the political um, uh, dogma behind this and as it's I say this is, this, is, this is something that's been going on since the 80s and uh, just for uh, frankness I went to an independent school in the 80s and I remember the argument then was about abolishing um, independent schools for the, sim for the similar reasons. Well, this is not um, abolishing, but is it, independent no, no, schools? This no, this is about... This is about the, this is, no, no, I agree, I, I understand. But, I mean, the, the, the argument, the, philosophic, the philosophical argument behind it is similar. But what? I come back to the economic point. I just don't think well, the, 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 the numbers stack up to actually be able to drive well, uh, the, the, the investment. Well, let me put this to you. This is what Michael Gove went on to say in this article. Private school fees are VAT exempt. That tax advantage allows the wealthiest in this country, indeed the very wealthiest in the globe, to buy a prestige service that secures their children a permanent positional edge in society at an effective 20% discount. 
Do you agree? I come back to the point, actually, what you're going to be affecting. The unintended consequence of all of this is not those people who, yes, you will get 20% of those um, extra from those people because they will pay it. They'll happily stump up the cash for that. What you will starve is the people in the middle, the, 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 the taxi drivers, the, the towel taxi drivers that are going into Whitgift School in Croydon, um, the people that are giving up or maybe working a second job to put their people through mm. uh, 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 um, some of the schools around uh, Sutton and Surrey, for example, around near my patch yes um, and they are the ones that will actually be pushed into a different school and add pressure onto those schools well do you accept then I mean you're a Brighton MP uh, <clears throat> there is a very prestigious school Brighton College in your constituency or in your area um, do you accept what Paul is saying that if you enacted those policies under a Labour government that there would be a certain number I don't know how many pupils who wouldn't be able to afford an increase or hike in the fees that Brighton College would charge? They'd have to leave. I don't think Brighton College is a great example because I think Brighton College will always be able to recruit at the price that they're paying, including the rate. Fine. But, but, but I'm not I've talking got to tell about you, Joe, I'm about the pupils that might not be able to go in the way that Paul has described. I have already been to independent schools in my constituency to explain firsthand why we have this policy. And it comes down to this. Our, our finances as a country are shot. Mm. Because of the mini-budget, we have massive pressures. So if we are going to invest in other areas of public life, we've got to raise the money from somewhere. Where is the fairest way to do it? Now, right now, we are subsidising private education. The question is, if we are going to invest more in carers, in making sure that kids don't go to school hungry and they can eat at the beginning of the day, in getting the class sizes down, in investing in the quality of teaching we have, getting a great, great teacher in every classroom mm. because we can get the uh, professional development done, we've got to raise the money somewhere. If you take, so if you take we the are economic... saying we will do it by raising money, well, let... by taking away a tax break that even the former education secretary, Michael Gove, says is egregious. So just, hold on a sec, just a quick look. At the moment, you talk about subsidising by 20%, 20%, you are paying effectively 20% towards those children's education. You will be paying 100% towards those children's education if they were in the state system. Right, let's just talk about fairness mm. because this is what the argument comes down to. It's interesting listening uh, to the two politicians talk about aspiration, uh, talk about fairness, talk about in difficult economic times you have to make choices um, and there are no sort of pain-free choices uh, presumably where do you think this is going to sort of end this uh, discussion uh, because I think it is probably the most outspoken I've heard mm. of discussion on the charitable status for private schools yeah well I think there's two things isn't there one is where does the argument go around the numbers mm -hmm. so the extent to which this can either generate money or cost money for the for the exchequer and where does the evidence basis of that go if the argument becomes as passionate as it looks like it might. Mm. But then there's the bigger picture argument, which we've, we've seen fleshed out here, around those two weighty concepts. And they're huge concepts, aren't they? And yep. again, they're in the, the eye or ear of the beholder around fairness and aspiration. And as I say, for me, the striking thing in the exchange was both sides willing to lean into their existing position. So Rishi Sunak making a passionate defence around, you know, his notion around aspiration and Keir Starmer's around... Uh, around fairness, and you know, and where and where does that where does that end? Clearly, Labour are passionate about sticking to this and think that it's a, a vote winner. A vote winner. Uh, and, and the Conservatives will argue, uh, you know, on that point around aspiration that it can be a vote winner on the other side of that ledger. So it's just it's fascinating to me that after a couple of days where a Labour leadership might have felt nervous around such a big selling and influential newspaper as the Daily Mail gunning on a topic that, you know, in the grand scheme of things right now might seem relatively minor, um, the, the decision taken by the uh, Keir Starmer's team is, no, no, we're actually going to go for this and properly lean into it uh, in the big forum of the week. Just, Just to clarify, what we're passionate about is doing fully costed programmes, fully costed policies that are going to tackle the big issues at the moment. We're not going to run away from the big issues, but also with Rachel Reeves at the helm of the finances for us uh, and Keir Starmer, we are going to head on, ha tackle those big issues in a fully costed way. That means difficult decisions. That's what But it's also got to be now. dynamic. It's got to be dynamic because I, I've talked about displacement. I've talked about children com coming out. So if you just sit there and look at um, a cost of, right, we take that 20% back, that's one model. But if you actually look at the closures, the children that would come into the state system, that's a dynamic dynamic modelling that you must factor in. I'm intrigued, Peter, as well, that you made an argument <coughs> around the, the current state of the, the, the public finances as part of your justification. Does that mean it's temporary, that when the public finances were in a better place, you'd, you'd, you'd revert to, the, to where we are now? 
Well, it's, it's, it's absolutely true that the dial on fairness has changed since the 2000s when we removed a third of the charitable statuses and therefore... Yeah, but that's not what I asked. So I, I just now. wonder, no. is this a temporary so, thing that's a practical consequence of where the worse, public finances Because are. then you get all the cost and none of well, the benefit... Well, I'm, I'm just intrigued, I'm just intrigued, given that that was part of your argument. But so the dial on fairness will change again when Labour gets a grip on the finances right. again and gets growth back and into the economy. And would you change the policy? And we will have to make a decision at the time where we invest the, the, the proceeds of growth and we will invest that where it is most fairly... Oh, so it's temporary. It's right. a practical thing. So we will make decisions thing. at the time where we will invest. The, I think it's very unlikely that the first priority will be to reinvest in private education when we've got so much ambition for our state schools. We want to put private schools out of business by raising the standards in the state sector, not by taxing them. But this is a, a, a one in a generation challenge that the Tories have created because of blowing a hole in our finances. We've got to make tough decisions. It's really interesting that today Keir Starmer was rushing towards the tough decisions and he was spelling out the vested interests that he would tackle. But you're not rushing towards committing to it being a permanent shift. It's, you, you're, no. you're framing it as a an immediate response to current fiscal reality. What I'm not doing is tying the hands of any future Labour mm. government, but when fairness comes back to the economy, and it's a growing economy again, we will make decisions based on where the fairest way of spending it is. Okay. I think it's very unlikely that will be investing in the, pri in the well, private schools, but I think that these are decisions that the future Labour government will have to make, and that the, premise is, that the premise is it will be a Labour government, and that for me is quite interesting. Well, that is interesting on the philosophy question, isn't mm. it? Um, as you say, it, it looks as if it is a more pragmatic uh, response than a philosophical one, necessarily. Uh, without wanting to put uh, words into your mouth. I just want to uh, read you um, this piece of breaking news. This is the RMT union. We're in the middle, of course, of waves of strike action. Eurostar security staff to strike for four days in December over pay. Um, you can take a moment to read the rest of it. Um, as I say to Paul Scully, we heard Rishi Sunak saying uh, above inflation pay rises. The nurses have asked for 19%. Inflation is 11.5%. Uh, uh, um, is it unaffordable? Should they have below inflation pay rises only? Yeah, I think it's something that you've got to match up if you look at what's happening in the private sector as well. What we've tried to do is give a, a fair pay. We've accepted the recommendations of, of the pay review bodies. Um, well, uh, but the, obviously, I mean, the nurses strike, for example, just to give that, put that in context, that, I think it's £9 billion that we'd have to find for the um, increase in the NHS budget to, to satisfy that. So, so we need to work will, out so where, where that's going to go. Ahead. The historic strikes we need to make going sure, on strike We need December. to make sure that actually people can get around the table and have a, well, a reasoned proportionate um, uh, settlement now. Why? Because then, then we've got to make sure that actually the cost of living issue, the inflation pressures, don't last uh, 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 last as little as they can because otherwise we'll be back here the year after, the year after, and then jobs will start to go uh, as well. You want to get a grip on the finances, the public finances, as you put it. Do you agree, then, with Paul? It, it, it would be below inflation uh, pay rises for nurses. What's astonishing, listen to Paul, is he says we need to get around the table, but but when it comes to transport, Grant Shapps refused all summer and all and autumn to do so. Mark Harper just started be, the process. What would your offer be to come to the table, at least, well, to we would be as a recommendation to Two the things. Firstly, bodies. it wouldn't be happening in the first place. There were no strikes uh, in, in our health service uh, under the Labour government for 13 years. But that's what the, the first time, London, the city can't promise that. The first, that and the have first, zero the first time in 106 years that the nurses are going out on strike. So we need to get the government around yeah. the table. I mean, everything you, needs to be on the table when you yes. go into negotiations. Government needs to make sure that it is being a reasonable negotiating partner, but it's got to be active. You, we have industrial action right the way across our economy do. now, and it's only going to get worse. Do you agree, it won't get better though, until the second point I was going to make is uh, getting a grip on the basics of running an economy, getting the essential right, stabilising the economy, then getting growth into it. We believe we have the plan to do so. And in the meantime, do you agree with Rishi Sunak that those pay demands of 90% are unaffordable? I believe that he should get round the table and his government should and start negotiating and everything she needs to be on the table going into those negotiations. Are he they, needs to do right, are they right. unaffordable? It's not for me to say in each specific say whether it is. These are oh. Tory issues because of Tory mismanagement of the economy. You've been in for, you've been in for almost these, 13 no, 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 years. Honestly, they're not you Tory blew issues. a hole these in the UK finances issues. with a £45 billion pound hole. There is no resilience Peter, in our public services, there is no resilience in personal finances You started, finances you started off talking about the um, uh, the amendments to the to the bill later on, about the fact that uh, you know this is doing it for the country. This is not Tory issues. These are country issues. These are people Inflation up and down. Inflation is hitting these our are people, country worse. Yeah, than other these are people up and down. Simply because there is no and they twenty percent of, of households Peter, have no 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 savings whatsoever. These, these are people up and down the Northern country Ireland. that are being affected by the strikes. You have got Mick Lynch writing to hospitality sector mm. today to uh, to say 
um, oh, why don't you go and ask for the government, cap in hand, for, for, for extra support? Because I know we are going to be affecting you. And it is your you. government You're that is driving low-paid workers into the situation where they're forcing We're going to be affecting, you, affecting, to, affecting, to be affecting you in the lead-up to Christmas. Place. We're so, going to be disrupting your business. So well, I wonder how, a UK issue. how you'll address the argument as a government into the new year, where a viewer might think, whoever's fault it is, and clearly there's international factors that are playing into our current economic situation, of, of just a sense that stuff's not working, where you're seeing the scale of industrial action in so many different sectors that collectively people might just think things aren't working and fairly or otherwise sort of point the blame in, in the direction of the government. I don't, yeah, I don't think it would be otherwise, but I, but I totally understand, I understand that frustration because, you know, when people are just trying to go about their business, mm. just trying to get a train, just trying to get a tube, trying to get into work and do a day's work, when they see that disruption, they don't really care um, who's to blame? They just want stuff to work. Well, no, so they, were, they, they, they might want to blame people, and it isn't just transport, is it? We are talking about nurses, ambulance drivers, Royal Mail, civil servants, barristers. This is all on because your they're watch. Because they've all got the same pressure, and you are seeing this, uh, these same pressures, employment pressures around the world. You're seeing the same pressure in America, you're seeing the same pressure um, in Europe because of the same global inflationary and cost of living pressures. So um, we, ha we have to make sure that, as I say, How? our situation in the UK is as short a uh, d uh, difficult situation as possible by actually doing the things that Peter's saying, not having plans to do it in, 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 the, in the future, doing it now, making sure we can stabilise stabil the markets. I think Jeremy Hunt's statement um, went a long way towards that um, just, just recently. Make sure that we can get proportionate um, uh, pay deals mm. to, 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 so that, that we're not extending inflation Paul, into beyond another, 23. Right, there is another question, because you've uprated, decided to uprate pensions and benefits <clears throat> at 10.1%. Um, slightly below now uh, where inflation is. Why, 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 why won't you offer that? Why won't you put 10.1%? If you're giving it to, to pensioners and for people on benefits, well, why the, not give the, all these people the 10%? Negotiations, the negotiations themselves yeah. are there for the, the NHS, the, yeah. uh, the, the, well, the departments and the civil Why can't that be your guiding principle? Because we've accepted the pay review bodies that uh, the things that, that have come up with a you proportionate can guide, you can range guide of. That. I'm just saying, can you see why people watch? But what we're not well, why doing. Given, why are you uprating these things, these big uh, ticket items, um, <clears throat> rightly or wrongly, by 10.1 percent? Well, why, why won't you the give fiscal, that as a because thing? all the fiscal stuff around benefits and pensions and tax mm. is the respo direct responsibility of the chancellor. The, yeah. the, pay, the pay negotiations yeah, are, are, the, are the responsibility for. Uh, for well, train that operators, like etc. That no, like well, no ducking, because actually that's what Mark, you think you know, that's why Mark Harper got involved in the discussions to have that. Yeah. Uh, to have talks. But it's not him. Late. But it's not him doing the negotiations. Well, that's what I'm the saying. No, and at the same ticket, it, it, it isn't Mark Harper doing the negotiations. Should pay keep up with prices? Look, these things. First of all, you've got to get a grip on the economy, yeah. and then we're not well, speaking. So these listen, people are going listen, on strike he, he, now. Paul meant Paul, exactly, but we've seen these strikes coming. You could have seen this industrial action coming from space. It's been so long in the making. We've seen that the the, the underlying factors driving industrial action has been there. We've been talking about winter of discontent since last winter, about this winter. But what you also see so is people the, in the private sector that have not had a pay rise at all that are looking in on this slightly bemused, well, thinking, "Well, what I think about me?" But I think we'll find, I think we'll find private 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 pay is ahead of it. Yeah. Actually, in those, in those areas where they've been negotiating so with, so with, so with unions, right. actually, it's been a productive I mean, what would you say to Lloyd Russell Moore? He was sitting here uh, a little while ago saying that actually he thinks pay should keep up with prices or, or maybe go a bit beyond. Uh, do you think that is how many Labour MPs feel? That it should be our aspiration, but that's why we want to get a grip on running the economy properly. We would not be in this mess if we hadn't had a government that blew a hole in our finances. We've got to find £45 billion. You know, Paul mentioned Jeremy Hunt's uh, budget the other day and about it was about to tackle these issues. That budget was solely, and all the briefing and running up to it, was about appeasing the markets after having a £45 billion hole blown in it three weeks earlier by his own party. So, you know, this is the situation we're in. It's made worse. There are, there are international isn't, factors, isn't but don't deny there is... No. Very there doesn't mm. seem to be much difference between you guys. There's on, a big on, difference. On, on the, uh, the reality of these pay demands versus what is realistic in the current economic Chris, climate. there is a big difference because we're, we wouldn't be in this mess if we hadn't had the quasi quartang uh, budget and we hadn't had but 10 given years where of we are now, of the economy. Are you saying anything yes. any so, different? From having been driven into... The, I accept the premise of your question because having been <laughs> driven into this ditch by the Tories, how will the Labour Party get us out of it? I accept that. 
Uh, and we would do so by getting a grip on the essentials of the economy and working with where there needs to be uh, all, all, all parties in industrial disputes before they arise, hopefully, that so we can get the basics right. Yeah, I mean, effectively, but what we've heard is that, you know, well, yeah, you accept, accept, the, pre the, accept, the, accept the premise of the question, I'm not a Tory, is basically what Peter's saying. And, uh, but effectively, no, no, we're what, we're you, what you've seen is that Jeremy, Jeremy's, um, uh, put the, Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, has uh, put measures in place now to stabilise the economy, to then, we've got, then, then get to the next stage. We've got to clearly have the growth that Peter was talking about uh, uh, behind that, but we've got to make sure that we can get through a really difficult winter, that we can plug the gaps in the in, in the finances. But that it's not just uh, by a difficult situation. Right. You know that mini budget why was, was, the, why was the, the, the mini unstable. The mini, Paul? The, it was, why was the it was unstable, unstable anyway, yeah. and, and and it was it was made. further destabilised right. by the by the response to quasi well, um, budget. We're but going we've to, got to get to the next. It's time for change. I mean, it is time that Paul has just blown the lid on. We've just had we've just had the change. We've just had the change. We just had the change, and that's what the Chancellor has put in place. Let me just ask a quick question before uh, we go, um, Paul, because you're in charge of gambling. I mean, not personally well, in terms of but you are. <laughs> but can you tell us when the government will publish the gambling review white paper? Uh, it, it, all I can say is in the next few weeks. I really want to get it out of oh, the door. Oh, it is going to be before um, Christmas, is well, it's, it? It's going to be in the next few weeks. I'll tell you for why, because I've just literally uh, left a uh, meeting with Gambling With Lives and other people who have been really badly affected by that. I want to make sure I get it absolutely right, Definitely before rather Christmas. than rush out. Well, next well few if it's weeks. in the next few weeks, it is before Christmas, isn't it? Well, it depends how you define that, but look, <laughs> 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 I want to get out of doors as soon as possible. Talk about I just politicians' want to... arms. No, no, I want to get in right. time revealing, for a On that I'm, revealing no, bit I'm, of news, we've got to get it. that's all we have time for. Bye-bye. <laughs>